Welcome to the More Than Just a Doctor podcast. I'm your host, Lil Soprana, MD. I'm a life coach for physicians, a practicing hospitalist, a wife, a mom of two boys, a reader, a dancer, a dolphin enthusiast, and all the things. Just like me, you're more than just a doctor. And that's what we're gonna talk about each week. Doctor stuff, regular life stuff, and all the things that make life rich and interesting. I'm so glad you're here. Let's get started. Hello, friends. Thank you for coming to episode number 20 of the More Than Just a Doctor podcast. Today, I have a special treat. First time ever guest. Um, this is my great friend, Amanda Biondi. Hey, everybody. Um, she, I'm, I'm going to let her... Um, also tell you about herself, but uh, she is a nurse who has had a very varied and uh, interesting career. And we're going to talk about some of that today. She's also um, my friend from the town where my dad grew up, a little tiny town in South Carolina. And I want to tell people uh, real quick, the story of the day, like how we met okay. and how you lured me to Rover. Okay. <laughs> okay. So this was years ago, like seven, eight, nine. Yeah, so maybe. Was, yeah. It was a long time ago, maybe nine years. Yeah. Long time ago. So I'm coming to um, Charleston uh, to uh, get married basically and looking for a hospitalist job. And at the time in one of Amanda's uh, multiple iterations in her career, she was hospitalist, like manager, director of like the nursing stuff. And so I come for the interview and I met her and I was like, oh my God, she's so cool. We hit it off laughing, Darlington, you know, all, all the things. And then she picked me up in her Volvo station wagon piece of junk, and took me and we we're happy as clams riding over to the other hospital in her system. And I'm like, yay. I also met Jessica O'Reilly, I think, on that interview, too, mm-hmm. today, who I also love. Uh, and Jessica's back. But I'm like, okay, I'm sold, you know. And, and then I come back, you know, it takes forever to get a doctor job. And by the time I come back six or seven months later to take the job, you have disappeared. I was already gone. Total bait and switch. That's right. But eventually I got you back anyway. Right, right. Lured me back. It all worked out in the end. Yes, it all worked out. Yeah. So tell me a little bit about, um, I was just thinking through your career and I'm like, I bet I'm missing some things. Um, Because what I know, and so correct me if I'm wrong, you started um, as a BMU nurse. Is that right? That's right. Yeah. The psychiatric for those who are not in the know of what BMU is, behavioral medicine, the patients were had a psychiatric diagnosis, but were also fairly medically sick as well. Yes. 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 And then you got snatched up by the hospitalists. That's right. They That was a new concept at the time. Y'all, this is a long time ago. I've been a nurse for 20 years. Um, but the healthcare system that we worked for did not have a hospitalist program. And so at one point they contracted someone and they were great and they decided, hey, wait a second, we should just own the practice. So when they started that practice, they asked me to sort of move into a coordination role for the clinical, which I absolutely love to this day. I still say it was my favorite job I've ever had. I loved it. Yeah, you're a great fit for that. Like super, um, Amanda is super great clinically and like also with this very practical bent from a clinical standpoint which Mm -hmm. is what you must have to be a hospitalist person absolutely and then you also have which I'm curious um if you knew you had it or you figured it out after you got the job you also have a very um organized like you have sort of an operations brain for sure did you yes. know you had that before you took the job or? Uh, no. And I always, now I call myself a reluctant administrator because, you know, I never set out in healthcare 
to be in any kind of leadership role or any kind of administration position. I thought that I would just go to the hospital and work three shifts a week and that was it, you know, and then one day I'd retire. <laughs> but um, unfortunately, that's not what happened. I mean, fortunately or unfortunately, that's not what happened. But I didn't realize I've always been organized. I went to college on a leadership scholarship. You know, I, I've always I did had that. I did. Yeah, yeah, I did. Um, nerd alert. And um, I. I yeah, yeah, I know. That's not, that's not a secret. Right. Um, but yeah, I had no idea that I was so good at programmatic development, I guess, right. um, until I got into it. And, you know, I'm a problem solver. And that's really what programmatic development is, is just solving problems. Plus, I grew up immersed in healthcare. I'm the third generation um, pers- in my family to do public health. Um so I, I lived in that world. I grew up in that world of how to solve these kind of problems. And, you know, my dad practiced rural medicine and I watched him my whole life. So I, I, I like that problem solving aspect of the, of the job for sure. Yeah. Okay. Now, now the, um, the next piece of the puzzle, when she left me before mm-hmm. I really arrived, but I mean, this is really a cool part of your career story. Yeah. So hospitalist director, and I think that role really grew over, how many years did you do that for the hospital? I think it was there for about seven years I did that role um, and sort of did a hybrid of that role and then my next role um, when that came to fruition. But yeah, for seven years, I was with the hospitalist. Okay, so then then tell everybody what the next thing was. Another (laughs) big iteration. Yeah, a huge, huge iteration. Um, You know, part of, if anyone out there in listening land is in the hospitalist world, they know that length of stay and readmission rates are metrics that we have to um, pay attention to, right? And part of my role in the clinical coordination was to keep patients from coming back to the hospital. And what I found was that we didn't have a way to do that in in the low country because we're certainly not in our healthcare system because um, there's not enough access to care in this area. Um, And we are, well, we, the the hospital system that we worked for at the time was the only not-for-profit one in the community. And so I just started thinking like, what if the hospitalist There was a large number of them. What if they saw patients in some sort of follow-up capacity after they were hospitalized? Perhaps that could keep them from coming, keep the patient from being re-hospitalized or utilizing the emergency department in a way that it didn't need to be utilized. And I thought that was like the best idea I'd ever had, right? And so I went to the powers that be and they were like, Maybe. And then I went to the hospitalist and they said, heck no, we're hospitalists for a reason. We don't want to see patients in the outpatient world. Why would we do that? We're hospitalists. And I was like, oh, okay. Right. But <laughs> the stars had aligned and there were some primary care docs in the, um, in the system that wanted to retire, but not fully. And mm-hmm. so they kind of said on a wing and a prayer, like halfway through a year, okay, we'll let these guys like three days a week, y'all can see patients that are discharged from the hospitalist service. We'll just see how it goes. Like in the morning I would do my hospitalist job and then I'd walk across the street to the clinic and try to get it like set up. And in the first like three months we had prevented just so many readmissions and, um, and the ED utilization from patients that were enrolled dropped by like 90%. Wow. And so, oh, yeah. And so the hospital system went, hang on a minute, she might be on to something here. And so then I was allowed to do it for five days a week. <laughs> and um, that grew into a massive multi um, functional primary and preventative care clinic for the underserved. Um, we did not charge patients a dime who didn't have any insurance or money. We used our charitable funds. I fundraised for that millions of dollars to support that endeavor. And we just started taking care of people and it grew into a large clinic that still exists today, although I don't run it anymore. Um, it's still going strong. And I feel like that probably creating that clinic in, in that area of town where there was a huge need um, is probably my crowning jewel of my career doing that. And then when the pandemic hit, 
Y'all I remember was going to ask you about that. I'm like, <laughs> Y'all remember the pandemic. Right? Right. Um, yeah. And somewhere in this chaotic mix of things, I, I somehow convinced uh, Lil to come and work at the clinic for, for me uh, yeah. to see those patients that she used to see in the hospital to now see them in the clinic and help me prevent those readmissions and help me decrease that utilization um, in the ER. And I think we had a lot of, we had a lot of fun doing it. For oh, sure. we had a ton of fun. Yes. Yeah. Um, I was like, I'll but, come, but I gotta have an office like next to you. Like, yeah, absolutely. Yeah. I have yeah. to go and sure. have fun at work. Yeah. And then um, the a date that seared into my brain for all of eternity on March 16th of 2020, the CEO at the time of the company I worked for squatted down next to me at a meeting full of 500 people, our leadership meeting and said, Hey, um, that was a Wednesday, uh, in case anyone recalls. I said, Hey, can, on Monday, let's set, let's, we need to do a drive through COVID 19 testing site in the parking lot of your clinic. Can you just set that up? Oh now we, uh huh, yeah. So that was a Wednesday. And uh, 96 hours later, I opened uh, a drive through COVID testing site that tested over 100,000 people. That is so insane. People, I just want to give you a visual. This part, this is not a giant parking lot no. of like, a, you know, a multi um, no. story building. It's like a standalone. It used to be a, back in the day. Um, it used to be an urgent care, standalone urgent care. So it's got like one little opening and maybe 20 parking spots total. Mm-hmm. May, actually, maybe not even that many. Not even. Yeah. And no way really for people to turn around. <laughs> Yeah. So no, picture. only, yeah. Only picture, one entrance. Right. Right. So yeah. picture, picture this hundred thousand, a hundred thousand people before it was all said and done. Right. And while the clinic was still going. Correct. So the clinic still went and that, that mm-hmm. was the clinic was going on inside our primary and preventative care services, mental health services, all of the things were going inside our ambulance services ran out of the back. And in the meantime, we were swabbing people seven days a week. I think I, I think at one point I counted that I worked 500 days in a row, 500 days in a row. Yeah. So, okay. I'm that, getting was, like, that was my COVID experience. Just, <laughs> like just to hear you, cause you know, it's, it's been a minute, but like, just to hear you talk mm-hmm. about it again, like I'm getting like tightened up in the chest, like just to, like feeling like that shit was so stressful. Oh, it, was, it was the For most you. stressful thing. Like, I've and ever I just knew about it a little bit cause I was there for mm-hmm. half of it, but I wouldn't, I yeah. didn't have shit to do with that. People no. organize a drive through swab. Oh, yeah. I, I just like that is, I, and I'm not, not, you know, like I'm not a lab technician, right? I didn't, I didn't know, like, I didn't know anything. The day after that, my CEO told me that I was at the clinic and the big wigs from our healthcare system all came into the clinic and I had to, <laughs> I had to perform for them donning and doffing because they, they had no idea like how long that would take and how we would have to factor in those things into the amount of human beings we could test. Um, and I just remember thinking to myself, shit, we're, I, I'm explaining to the human beings that run our entire organization how to put gloves on properly. And like, they don't know. And, you know, I, th- I mean, obviously that's, I'm not, I don't, that's not a secret that I think one of the major problems in healthcare is that the people who run the places don't know how to do the work, <laughs> but I, I just thought to myself, okay, it's up to me. Like it's who else is going to do this? Like someone has to do it. I went to nursing school. I took that stupid oath. I got to do it, you know? Um, and so I did, I did what had to be done. And we had a less than 5% recollection rate on our specimens. I, I ran a tight ship, but it damn near killed me for sure. It, yeah. I mean, I can attest to that. It was, it was. I no a- longer work for that organization. Right. <laughs> it was, yeah. it was, uh, such a high volume, relentless, and you really had no backup from the, like if things went wrong on a Sunday, it was you. Yeah, it was, it was me. Yeah. I didn't leave. We didn't, you know, we couldn't travel, didn't go anywhere for, oh, you know two years two and yeah so it was it was a brutal time but it was a brutal time for everyone in healthcare. it was but you know 
it was that, I mean, I, I, that was extra, like that was a lot. And I'm like, I pre just as a person, as an employee of the system, as a person who worked with you, like I should really appreciate it. Like that was a huge service you did for all of us. So. Yeah, no, I, I do feel very proud of it. And uh, on my desk here, I keep one, like it's obviously was never open, but I keep one of the original swabs. We used to have to get them overnighted from Virginia in the beginning of the pandemic, we didn't even have enough supplies for any of that. So I, I always keep one on my desk to remind me of that time and, and my perseverance through that time, but also to not allow myself to be put in a situation where my employment is running my life instead of the other way around. Ah, Valuable lessons were learned. Yes, valuable yeah. lessons were learned. Because I didn't have a work-life balance at all. No, no, it was, it was insane. It was insane. Yeah. Um, okay. So then, so, and that's another, like one of the things that I have wanted to talk to you about, because so at that point, we're coming like 2022 out of the pandemic, mm -hmm. you had worked for um, Roper for how long at that point? For like 17, 18 years. Yeah. That's a long time. Yes. It's the only job. Like I started there when I was a nursing student. And then I left with a master's degree in nursing. So that's how long I've been there. <laughs> yeah. yeah. So I want to, so I want you to tell um, the listeners like what you're doing now, but I also then after that, I really want to pick your brain a little bit about that transition. When you've been at a place, I mean, it's a little bit like being married. Oh, like, for, for sure. sure. And I feel like a lot of um, physicians I work with and like physicians I coach, I just feel like the the fears and this, all the things, emotions that come up ar around switching a long time organization um, probably don't get enough consideration. Mm -hmm. That's true. Yeah. So now I'm the director of operations for Agape Care Group's palliative care services. Um, and Agape Care Group serves the Southeast, uh, South Carolina, North Carolina, Georgia, Louisiana, and now um, and Oklahoma as well. So um, yeah, so it's really exciting. We provide in-home palliative services as well as um, I have nurse practitioners in our inpatient units. We have several across the state. Um, so it's a really fun and exciting job and it's new. It's a brand new program for them too, less than a year old. And so that was kind of part of the, one of the reasons I was hired is that's kind of my thing is development of new programs or looking at programs that are in their infancy and saying, okay, this doesn't work. This, this does work and sort of improving process because the process improvement is sort of like something I love to do. Uh, you know, I like, I like efficiencies. Efficiency is my love language. I always say. Um, and so, uh, yeah, so I'm kind of doing that now. And, um, I liken it to walking. I told, I, I told my boss this, I said, it's like walking across a beach and unturning every pebble and finding that there's something under the pebble that you need to either cheer about or jeer about. And then you got to put that pebble right back where you found it once you, um, you know, uh, make the change. So it's a, it's a steady, it's been a, you know, it's a journey when you're, um, coming into a new, um, program like that. And then of course, just learning a whole new culture. Mm -hmm. of an organization after so many years that are not-for-profit i'm now at a privately owned equity owned company that is for profit and so that's a totally different change for me and um you know one that i was afraid to make of course yeah of course but um i'm very glad that i did it that's for sure yeah because it, it was like you said it's it, my relationship with my ex-employer was a bit like a marriage and as a matter of fact, as long as my marriage, pretty much, like I was marrying my, I married my husband right before nursing school. So like, so as long as, you know, um, and I, I really did think that I would retire from that organization, but you know, things change and um, philosophies and healthcare change and leadership changes. And uh, I don't have to agree with all of that. And I can go and I have, I didn't realize probably, I think, one of the things that I didn't realize about myself was that I am talented and I do have gifts to offer another organization or a different place that I didn't think I really had because I'd been at that one place for so long. Um, I think I was probably like, well, no one will know, you know, no one will know how talented I am because I've, I've only done it here. 
Right. But that's not really the case, <laughs> which is great. <laughs> yes. Yes. Turns out not to be true. <laughs> Turns out that's not the case. If you're good at what you do, you can be good at it somewhere else. <laughs> yeah. Um, and, but I was scared for sure to leave. Yeah. And what else? Like, so some of the things I think, so I'm, I'm the opposite. Like I've had a bunch of jobs and a bunch of jobs. I know. <laughs> And really not at all because of unhappiness. Like I like have had a bunch of jobs I really like, you know, I've moved, I kind of like change and Mm -hmm. so, and not afraid to, you know, pivot and repivot and come back. And, um, but I know, like, I do feel like, um, like fear sometimes, but I also think, I, I mean, I wonder, I'm curious from the other standpoint, like what else, like maybe kept you from leaving? I mean, because you've had offers. I know this, like, Mm -hmm. yeah, you know, people know that you do good work and you've had job offers. Like Mm -hmm. what, what are some other considerations that kept you in this long-term relationship? Um, probably because the work was really altruistic. Mm -hmm. And so I felt guilt if I I felt guilt about going to like a for-profit Play, or, uh, you know, or not being a public servant anymore, you know, like that was something that I struggled with a little bit because I'd always kind of done that, worked in that space, provided care for the humans that people in society didn't necessarily want to care for, you know, the mentally ill, the homeless, the drug addicts, you know, right. these guys, the super users of healthcare systems. Right. And so I, I was like, well, if I don't do that, if I'm not leading that charge, Will it just fall through the cracks? But, you know, I mean, that's ridiculous for me to think that just me would have that effect, right? Of course, it's not going to fall through the cracks. Like, of course, I can leave. And of course, someone younger, smarter, faster, with better ideas is there, you know, they're cranking them out all the time. And so um, that's a good thing, I think. Um, But yeah, I really was um, trepidatious about leaving that part of healthcare because yeah. that's kind of that was my specialty really is community health you know but the the flip side of that coin is I've done my time right okay years. you're actually still okay true confessions you're actually still doing community health yeah yeah that's true I still do community health I have a part-time a side hustle as I like to call it and I work with a mobile health unit um, that delivers care to the underserved in, in the low country. It's a huge need. Um, uh, and it definitely fills up my cup for, for that aspect. But um, it's, uh, you know, I'm, I'm trying to work very hard now while I can so that I can retire very young. <laughs> nice, nice. Okay. I want to say one thing, um, not especially to you, but like for our listeners, One thing that I think like an image I have about work, leaving work, um, having that idea that if I leave like this, these patients won't get taken care of, like nobody can do it but me. Like that's a very common um, belief in healthcare. Um, Especially, um, I thought about it in particular a lot. Uh, We had a beloved um, infectious disease physician mm-hmm. who passed away very mm-hmm. unexpectedly a few yeah. years and you know she and I have never had this direct conversation but I just imagine that she was she was super dedicated that was like she was very her, dedicated her hallmarks and I just kind of had the idea that she might have been a person who thought like if I retire or whatever if I stop like the work halt and nobody cares about it but I sort of imagine and this is a good image for me it might be gross to other people I sort of imagine like the work and like the the filling in of like the hole that our absence creates is like ants like kind of marching in over the hill or whatever it's like space loves a vacuum yes space loves a vacuum and it doesn't like the problem gets solved like we don't know how but like our patients will get taken care of like yeah. someone will come, someone new will come. They think, oh, we can never recruit this spot. Well, like they figure it out when we're not here. <laughs> right, right, right. I know that's, I mean, I think I think just every time I think that way, I think to myself, don't be so arrogant, Amanda. Like of tons of, you know, there are millions of talented human beings out there 
who can, who are doing this work and feel passionate about this work, you've, you've done it. You've done, you've done your time. You've done it. You created something that hopefully will be there for many years to come. Um, and so, and that's, you know, that's a mark that I can leave on the low country, um, you know, feel good about. Oh, and I also wonder, and I, I don't know the answer to this. Are you like, do you get the joy in the creation and setting the systems up? And then once it's running, like, bye. Yeah. 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 I need a new challenge. Maybe. Um, I really do enjoy taking care of providers. That's always been something I love. That's probably why the hospitalist job was a favorite of mine is because I just really got to take care of y'all in the clinical setting. Um, so, but yeah, when I get something up and running smoothly and I'm like, okay, well, I'm not one to sit on my laurels, you know, like I I always want to do something else. And so I think that's, um, why it appeals to me now in this stage of my career after starting three or four different programs that like, this is kind of my thing. And that, um, you know, and i I reflect back now, it took me such a long time to make the decision to leave that company I'd been with for so many years for, you know, so many reasons to be afraid of that or hesitant of that. I took a really long time to make the decision. But now I think to myself, okay, yeah, like, sure. Why, why <laughs> did not next? Like, right. Yeah, yeah. Like BFT, I left that place. Right. Okay, cool. Like, let's, let's go on another adventure. I've never been like that before. It's quite freeing. Yeah. That's, that's awesome. And I love that. I love that you're doing like, you're sort of using your powers in the highest good. Like you're like, you set up the program, all that energy and problem solving and work. And then like when it's running smoothly, like then you get to go and do it again and that's the work you like. That's the work you're great at. And I think it really serves the world when all of us do the work that we like the most. Mm-hmm. Even if we're good at, like, you were great also at just running the clinic. You were mm-hmm. fantastic at it. But that's not what you like the most. Right. I think it serves more when we, like, we catch that work that we like and we're good at. Mm-hmm. For yeah. sure. I, I made me think, I never knew that I would be good at fundraising and talk and talking to be, I'd never, that's not something I'd ever done, but at one and point, you're ridiculously our, good at it. Yeah. At good one point, people, our, we're going to be good at it. Yeah. Million, millions of dollars. Uh, yes. Yeah. Um, uh, yeah. At one point, my organization said fundraise to operate. And I was like, oh, okay. I mean, go find some rich people who want to give us some money. But it, first of all, it's easy to to get someone excited about doing work for people who don't have access to care. That's not a hard sell, in my opinion. But uh, I never knew that I, that's something I would enjoy, you know, but I loved it. I loved that aspect of the job. And so now that's something that I've got in my toolbox that I never knew that I had and I can implement that in in a variety of ways. So that, you know, it's things like that, those experiences that, you know, sort of lead you down your next path. Right. 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 Yeah. Um, I'm learning to be not so rigid about it, you know? Yeah, no, this has been a, I think a very um, fun and interesting time for you. Yes. Yeah, for sure. Growing out of the comfort zone, like doing. Yep. Working from home, out of working from home, all the things, yeah. Yeah. All so. Okay, I want to ask you about. um, You mentioned retiring early, Mm -hmm. and um, so we've talked about this a number of times uh, with a glass of wine in hand, and when things are going really well with cheese and bread and crackers, that's the the best way. Yeah, but I can share it. So she's married to an Italian. Mm-hmm. and part of the dream because I know like people like this is like a hot thing right now and we've talked about like retiring to Italy right right what might that look like and tell us some of the truth because you know like way way more than most people like some of the um insider on moving actually moving there 
for sure for sure yeah um yeah we i'm my husband is italian he was raised in america but he's italian giuseppe giovanni bianchi and um my father-in-law lives in italy we go uh at least twice a year which is i mean you know who can complain about that and so we'd like to live there at least part of the time i always joke and say you know there's a target in italy so i probably can't live there all the time yeah um but uh it is a wonderful place to be um but you know these one dollar houses that they are one euro houses that they have for sale i mean my yes. husband and I, like we get the biggest kick out of that because good luck to you you know sure sure you buy that euro you buy that house for a euro that's in a village where four other people live. Okay. No one lives there. That's why they are begging you to come there and spend your dollar on a house that it's a thousand years old. So it doesn't have any plumbing <laughs> and the electrical wires are all on the outside of the walls and it needs to be completely redone. Right. Which is fine because labor is cheaper and materials are cheaper there. But you have to promise the government that you're going to be able to complete that task in a certain amount of time. Oh, okay. I didn't know that. Yeah, yeah, you have to, you, uh, yeah. And as a matter of fact, they're going to take some money, probably about 20 or 30,000 euros to make sure that you do complete it in the right amount of time. But, and I don't mean to offend anyone who is an Italian citizen. I love that country. It's my favorite oh, place wow. on earth. She loves it. She but, brags, this, this bitch brags when she's going to Italy for months in advance. Yeah. It's, it's terrible. But <laughs> like things don't work like they do in America. So if you give the government $30,000 of your money to hold, well, you may never see it again, okay? Yeah. And if you put it in a bank, it's probably not that safe. You're gonna wanna deposit that money in the post office where your bank is, where your money is the most safe. Now, you can't really do any of that unless you have um, a social security number in Italy. So you'd have to apply for that. Um, and then mortgages don't really work like they work over here. You're not borrowing $500,000 to buy a house. They're not going to lend you that kind of money. They don't have that kind of money to lend you. It's Italy. You know, <laughs> like they're, they want you to move there and influx them with revenue. Right. Yeah. So, and then, okay. So let's just say you do all that and you're like, fine with it. Okay. So now you have to renovate your home. Okay. Well, you're an American. So any Italian contractor is going to see you coming from <laughs> kilometers away. And they're going to take advantage of that. Plain and simple. Yeah. So, and you know, if you don't have enough wine to feed them at the end of the day, then you may not see them for a couple of weeks. And you know, they, not that I'm not saying they're unreliable human beings. I'm just saying that they also are looking for an opportunity. Right. Right. And so right. it doesn't, you know, you're going to get good quality work because the craftsmanship from what I've seen um, in my father-in-law, my mother and father-in-law's house and the subsequent things that they've built is amazing and cannot be cre recreated. But again, here you are an American, you're probably not going to be there all the time. Also, fun fact about Italian houses, if someone moves in there and squats in there, you're never going to get them out. Really? Yeah. 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 So then you got to worry about, okay, how secure is my property when I'm not there? All the things. So it, it's a big endeavor. And, and now so many um, expats are trying to live there. And this is especially true in the South of Italy, mm -hmm. um, I, which I'm not as familiar with. Full disclosure, um, we're Emilia Romana is the is the territory of Italy, the region of Italy, where our home and family are. So that's where we go the most. Mm -hmm. uh, my the view from my porch looks into Tuscany, but I'm actually in Emilia Romana. So, um, but in the south, there there's been so many there's been an influx of expats, and and so now there aren't a lot of these one dollar houses for sale. Um, I mean, you can, but you can still real estate, fully renovated, nice real estate is still cheaper than it is certainly than like here in Charleston. Um, you're still going to, your, your dollar is still going to go far. My father-in-law uh, worked in America for ever for 50 something years. So he was a tax paying citizen. You know, he, he has, he takes his social security and he is able to live extremely comfortably 
Whereas in America, you wouldn't really be able to live that comfortably, as you know, um, people who are just on social security, they're in the poverty line, right? Um, uh, and then also they have universal health care there. So um, he doesn't, and I'm not saying that it's good, right? You know, but it is um, covered, right? So nobody is going to go bankrupt to get a cancer treatment in, in a country with socialized medicine. Um, now you may not get preventative treatment. You know, there's not a, you know, they don't do a lot of, a whole lot of preventative stuff, but, um, in America, you know, healthcare is for the rich and, um, in, in, in Italy, it's not like that. So that's, you know, that's really nice and they really value elderly people there. And I love that part of the culture, but it's, it's not as easy as you would think it would be to just buy that one Euro house and move over there and live your under the Tuscan sun dream. <laughs> I just saw part, we, we just saw part of that movie the other night. I fell asleep before I was like, I don't know if I've ever seen this, but yeah, I was thinking of you. I was like, <laughs> yeah, we looked at a house actually uh, behind my father-in-law's house. That's been for sale for 30 years. Okay. Nobody has nobody looked at it. Right. Right. So this is just like sums up Italian culture. So this is a small village, right? So, word gets out that we're coming when they know when we're coming to visit you there's only like 100 people who live there so um then they found out that we wanted to look at the house okay and when they found that out they raised the price like a hundred and thirty thousand dollars and then they decided they were going to have like a an auction for it you know maybe drum up some bids right and so um we went and looked at it and um, then they ultimately the mayor decided that he was going to sell it. It went from being like 30,000 euros to 186,000 euros because he wanted to pave a road in the village. And so okay. if we bought the house, he could pave the road. And, right. um, you know, these these rich Americans, surely they will just write us a check for this. And so we just laughed and laughed and laughed. And the house still sits there and it'll sit there probably for another 30 years that nobody will buy it. Um, Have they had an auction yet? No, they they weren't even able to get enough people to do an auction. <laughs> okay, Aww. they just told us that, thinking that we would be dumb enough to like write this because it's like a huge five hundred thousand square foot home with beautiful grounds looking out to the scenery for one hundred thirty thousand right. dollars. So like, oh, they'll it'll be fine. They'll just pay for it. But no, because we could have gotten it for thirty grand. <laughs> Right. And you know what it's going to take to get it done. Right. Okay. And the only reason that you can do that is because Pops, your father-in-law lives right yeah. down the hill. He'd be there. And Absolutely. Yeah. I mean, like, this isn't like... We have an infrastructure there. We have people yeah. that we trust. When we went to look at the house, we took our we took the engineer. Um, Pops' best friend is a contractor. He did all the work at Pops' house. So we took him. Um, you know, people that we could trust. And, and if we buy outside of that village, we will take those people with us to make sure that we're not getting ripped off. And I mean, my husband's fluent in Italian, but still, you know, we're still Americans. We have an American sensibility. Right. I think anywhere you go outside the U S you just have to be really careful about living that expat dream, you know? And then also I would say, keep your citizenship in America because, you know, if you need something like it's not, I mean, it's the first world, but it's sort of like, I call it like 1.5 maybe, you know? Yeah. Um, because modern conveniences, like you're just not popping out to the target for something. Right. Ever. There, right. There, is, there isn't that. So, you know, and they're just now getting Amazon. Like my father-in-law can just now get Amazon delivered to his house. <laughs> yeah, so. Umalva. Well, oh, they, I know, I know. It's crazy. Like when he needs something now, like vitamins, we have to buy the whole village stuff all the time, you know, because you can't really get like one of the things that they love for some reason is like name brand Advil and Tylenol. Okay. Right. You're just yeah. getting the acetaminophen and ibuprofen in Italy. Okay. You're not getting anything name brand. No matter how many times I've tried in my life to explain that that acetaminophen and that Advil are made by the same child in an Indonesian factory. One of them gets stamped Advil. One of them gets stamped ibuprofen. They get put in different bottles, but like my mother-in-law never would believe it. She always thought that the name brand was better, right? 
So we send them name brand vitamins, name brand Tylenol, name brand Advil through Amazon and they love it. It's like, it's amazing. Yes. It's amazing. Awesome. I love that. Well, of course, um, I'll be, I'm, I'm, uh, certain that you and JJ will overcome all the obstacles. Yes. It's a lovely place for me to come visit. Absolutely. 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 Yeah. He'll be there for a month in, in, in October. I'm so jealous of that because I actually tried in the spring to go for a month and I tried to work right. while I was there. And I got to tell you, it's not as great as I thought it was going to be. <laughs> yeah. I'm sure it, it, the internet is not, yeah. Not yeah. And the time, the time change was really hard too. Um, and so that, that sort of has changed the way I've thought about the future too, because you know, if I want to keep a part-time job or something, um, you know, nowadays you can do work all over the world. Right. Um, but it was a little bit different because of the time change. Um, an afternoon meeting would be at 11 PM there, you know, and that was just, it's a no. I know everyone was having fun and I thought, well, I shouldn't be working. I should be having fun. Yeah. Yeah. So, yeah. So I don't, I don't, I'm not going to try that again in the fall. I'm just going to take a vacation. Nice. Yeah. I know you actually had to coach me because I was going to like take all my computer set up and like an extra monitor and my speaker and all these things. And you said, no, don't do that. You just, it'll be okay. <laughs> Yay. And it was, it was fine. <laughs> yeah. Yay. Okay. This has been super fun. Yes. It's been great. I do a uh, one more question. Mm -hmm. Uh, you have uh, ushered a lot of doctors through hospitalists and then through primary care. And like you, mm -hmm. and you said earlier, I, I can't remember if you use this word, but like taking care of, like that is your like thing, very, mm -hmm. like, very much mentor and help. And what advice do you have for uh, physicians, new or old? Cause you've had people on the variety of spectrum and yeah. um, I'm curious what wisdom you have for us? Um, I was thinking, you know, I think that oftentimes, um, I, I was talking to a, a, a old provider that I used to manage and she was telling me that, you know, her practice manager, well, she was sending emails about the call schedule changes and doing these things. And it was really stressing her out. And I just stopped her and I said, you know, you're a doctor, right? You diagnose and treat medical conditions. That's your job. Right. Um, a practice manager can send an email. A practice manager can change the call schedule. Don't let your role be confused with running a practice. Don't, you know, let give the administrators the space to do what they need to do. Um, and don't let them rope you into doing things that aren't patient care related, unless you really want to, unless you're really passionate about that side of it. I think nowadays, so many um, healthcare organizations um, and healthcare systems want doctors to have MBAs as well. I mean, yeah. what? That's like, you're a doctor, be a doctor, you right. know? And conversely, these physicians who go to medical school, never practice medicine, and then just become an administrator, like, uh, I don't, probably don't know how it feels. Yeah. It, it, yeah. And I mean, that's the other advice that I have when I think about my role as an administrator versus what I can offer um, providers, physicians, is that the lens in which administrators look at healthcare is not the same lens that you have, you know? Um, and I make a good administrator because I was a clinical human being. Mm -hmm. I have done CBR on humans and I've had a colostomy bag explode on my body and I you know like people right. have thrown up on me and I've seen bleeding and all the things and I've held people while they died and all of those things that you do as a clinician that impart that human aspect to it you know and I think a lot of times I I fail to realize that some of my counterparts that I sit in meetings with they've never had that experience because they have an MBA or an MHA or an economics degree. And that's very valuable, but that's a, they look at the world through different glasses than, than we do. 
right? It's just a different thing. And I think that recognizing that will cut down on some of the frustration and, and heartache and that you get when you work in a healthcare system, because you're not going to understand why these decisions are being made sometimes, because they are going to appear to be stupid decisions or decisions that you as a clinician wouldn't make. But again, they've got a different lens that they're looking through and um, both lenses are valuable. Right. I would just um, tell, especially new docs to be sort of, you know, aware of the political fray that goes on inside a healthcare organization and maybe try to avoid it as much (laughs) as humanly possible unless you love politics. Right. You know, my daddy used to say all the time, like I didn't understand it when I was a kid, but my dad would say, I got to go politic. He was a pediatrician in a right. rural area, right? Yeah, I got to politic it. And I'm like, politic, you like take care of strep throat and stuff. Like I didn't get it because I was a child. Um, but now, yes. uh, now, I, now I understand that you've got to, you know, do those things and be involved in the politics side if you want to push a program forward right. um, or if you want to start a program. But if you want to be a clinician that takes care of human beings, stay out of that fray. You know, um, it's for some people for sure, but it is not, it is not for everyone. And you became a doctor for a reason. Right. And getting pulled into that political realm, um, unless you have aspirations to be a chief medical officer or to work in administration. Or like you said, some people actually really enjoy all that politicking. Yeah. But I I totally agree with you that they're, I mean, and not just healthcare, every organization is, is full of politics. Absolutely. Yeah. I I can only speak to this one, but literally Mm -hmm. like, like that's what they are. And so many um, physicians, I mean, people just don't, like they've come through medical school and then residency and like on this very sort of narrow, very difficult, but narrow path mm-hmm. and they don't realize all this is going around. And so like, they think that they can just go in and like make a change or whatever. And you don't right. realize that, oh, it's actually, that's Polly's department. And right. I mean, <laughs> yeah. And that's not just in your, I mean, I also think, so I think there's a, you know, naivete when you're starting that and people don't Mm -hmm. realize. And I think a lot of times the the first thing is to think, oh, my organization is corrupt or dysfunctional or whatever. No, no, no. This is any organization. That's right. It is, it is political. Human beings are fallible. So they have motivations that you have no idea about. Like it's all this emotional stuff. And if you don't have, I coach, I love actually to coach people on this to help people navigate this in other systems. I mean, I just love it because once you start to learn these things, like to figure out like, oh, like this is the priority of this other person and this is why mm-hmm. and it may not be what the written priority is. Like then you can like navigate all this stuff with more ease. Um, but back, like one step back, is like, it's it's everywhere. There's nothing wrong with it. It's just like, that is the way of the world. Just the way the world works. Yeah, the world yeah not yeah. just your, where no. your institution, like this is the way of the world. And if you want to get through that right. stuff and get anything done, you got to learn how the world works. Yeah, you do. And you have to learn to just, you know, sit in that room and think to yourself, I'm the smartest person in here. Oh, that's a good one. Yeah. I mean, I, I've thought, I'm, and I don't, I'm not braggadocious enough to think that I'm some super genius, but it's been my uh, experience that I sit in a lot of rooms and a lot of C-suites and I think to myself, damn it, I'm, I'm the smartest person here. Um, that's a little scary. So just, you know, I just, it's not scary. You're very smart. And very, but it is like, yes. Yeah. Yeah. But I mean, I'm just saying like, it's just, it's a helpful reminder that this, you know, everything, the politics is just part of the, of the, of the of the career you know and if you if you hate it then stay as far away from it as you can right um and and listen to your administrators who were once clinicians you know they they typically i'm not saying they all do but um most of the best administrators i've ever known were also clinicians 
And I think statistically, you know, magnet hospitals and hospital systems that are run by nurses who have a strong clinical and administrative backgrounds have better clinical outcomes because of that care. You know, when that whole Lean Six Sigma thing was so popular, when everyone, we, I had to take it, I'm a green belt. I just, it, it made me mental that we used a car manufacturing principle to take care of humans. That blows my mind that that's, that someone thought that that was a fantastic idea. I mean, of course we can look for inefficiencies in care, but we don't manufacture people. Like these are human beings right. that we are care of and um i think as providers like you're the ones that have to remind the rest of the organization of that sometimes right that that is so true mm -hmm. awesome <laughs> yep. well thank you so much this was so much this fun. was great i had so much fun get the first guest i'm so excited Yes, and you and I will continue our conversations over some sparkling wine and cheese. I love this for us. Yes, me too. Okay. So, to see that soon and back to work for both of us. I know. Thank you again. I had a great time. This was great. Thanks so much for joining me today. If you like this episode, you're going to love working with me directly. Sign up for email updates from me in the show notes. I'll send you a fun email every week called Friday Favorites. Everyone loves it. Or if you're ready to get started creating your rich and interesting life, book a free consultation with me to explore working together one-on-one. -on -one. I can't wait to meet you. You'll find these links and other resources in the show notes. See you next week.